Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Cushman and Wakefield, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, New York Community Bank, Bank of America, Kilroy Metal Products, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Essex Capital Partners, Excel Realty Advisors, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, G.V.A. Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, John Katsimatidis, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Madison Realty Capital, Marcus and Millichap, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, the Moynian Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. You know, New York City, the country is in a little economic crisis. And people want to know, people have to live in New York. People wa love living in New York City. You know, the five boroughs or, or even the suburban areas, you know, Jersey City, uh, West New York. What's happening in the state of residential market? People don't really know. They sometimes listen to the newspaper. They listen to the press. But today, I brought together a group who really understand what's happening in the residential market, people actively involved with the residential market. My guests today include Joel Seiden, uh, managing member and co-founder of Stone Edge Partners, uh, Lloyd Goldman, uh, CEO of BLDG Management, uh, Chuck Brass, Executive Vice President of Atlantic Development uh, Group, and last but not least, uh, Philip Eisenberg, CEO of Urban American Management. So, Philip, you know, you've been around in a variety of aspects, once representing banks, you know, going into, what do you see happening today in the residential marketplace? I see uh, that um, people with cash are waiting around to buy because uh, there's a feeling that more distress is coming. Um, I see that the rental market is softening in the sense that uh, it takes us a little bit longer to, depending on the neighborhoods and the boroughs, longer to get um, an apartment released. Not a substantial amount longer, but there's, there's work that you have to do. Uh, in, in certain areas, we're uh, absorbing the broker's fee, and others we don't. In some places, uh, we're asked to reduce the rent uh, somewhat on a renewal. We haven't had much of that. Um, on the income side of it, we see uh, some uh, softening in the sense that some people are paying a little bit later. Uh, we haven't noticed any increase in, in evictions because I think that our workforce area is... But you have 12, 12 and a half thousand... Almost 15,000. Oh, close to 15,000 units. And a lot of that's workforce. You have that in the Bronx, you have it in parts of Jersey, you have it in Brooklyn, you have it in Queens. And Queens is, you know, it's a little different than Lloyd, who has about, I mean, not talking about the country, you have 5,000 really in Manhattan. Uh, and you, uh, Joel, you have about 2,500, 3,000 in, in Manhattan. And Chuck, you have a variety. I mean, you have ham you have about 6,000 units, but most of them are, are affordable. Correct. So, so what what are you seeing, Lloyd, today? Uh, you know, because I know. Look, I'm one of my friends lives in a in a, an apartment, and I said to him, you know, rents are down a little bit. You know, you got a three bedroom, you're paying this high price. Maybe you should call your landlord. Maybe you should see. How, how often are these phone calls coming in, Lloyd? Um, tenants call now on the renewals. A uh, few tenants are calling interim, but those phone calls are really futile on their part in 
um, take up time, but the agents in my office are, as well as the renewal and leasing people, are dealing with uh, tenant calls on renewals. Everyone wants a lower rent than they previously had. And they're looking into the market as to what the vacancies are more so, and they, they understand that uh, if they want to go into the market, the landlords are paying OPs, so they say... Explain to my... What do you mean OPs? I want just... Um, the owner pays the broker. Um, mentioned that the broker, the landlord has started paying brokers. Uh, and if that's the case, a tenant says, you don't have to pay the broker, I should get the discount. Um, but the rents have come off a little. How much have rents really come off in, in your view of your apartments that you have? Well, if you go back over an, a comparison to, say, 18 months ago, because it's it leveled off and OP started about nine months ago. The rents are probably off net effective 15 percent, 18 percent. On the face, they're probably off five to eight percent. And Joel, what do you see? I mean, you have uh, you have buildings. You have the you know you have some great buildings on 48th Street and 8th Avenue, and then you have 33rd Street. What are you yeah. saying today? I think um, in the market rate buildings, as Lloyd said. You are paying brokers. Um, there are concessions in place, maybe a month's free rent in some cases. Um, in other cases, you're making some slight adjustments. Uh, but again, the rental business in general, one big difference from, let's say, after 9-11, which is the last time I remember giving concessions, is we weren't seeing tenants at that time, and we gave concessions to try to find tenants. I think to, that's to, a very today, important point. Today, we literally have hundreds of people every month coming to look at our apartments. So there's a lot of traffic, there's a lot of people, there seems to be depth in the rental market. You just have to find the price point that they're willing to accept and then you can make deals. So we are very much making deals, Michael, and there is a rental business that is reasonably healthy, albeit at less rent. I, I know you have certain market rate apartments now and you're going to have some new ones come up there. What do you, f how do you guys feel that the market is having an effect? Because you had the apartment on West End Avenue that you opened in the right time, as one would say, at a high point, and now you're in a different time. Well, I think, you know, consistent with what everybody else is saying, that the market is a little bit softer. We uh, probably went through a little period of a couple of months where maybe we weren't as fine-tuned and saw our occupancy maybe drop off a little bit until we realized the, what we had to do in order to keep uh, the, the market rate component of the building fully occupied. But as Joel was saying, you know, if you do the right things, uh, if you keep the building up, uh, offer the right package, uh, we've been able to maintain now, uh, bring the building back up but to full so, occupancy so now, and keep So it now there. I have to throw a question. You have two new buildings, I mean, that are gonna come on the market. When's the first one coming on the market? Uh, hopefully they'll be both be on the market next spring. So, I mean, how do you project? I mean, you know, Lloyd's not building anything. Phillips not really building. No one's really building. How do you project what the future is going to be? Uh, I mean, I mean, I don't have my crystal apple over here. As well, much. it's it's difficult, and even during the uh, construction period, you know, we have to if looking at the market and trying to fine tune the plans of the building to make sure that we have uh, a product that we think will rent uh, when we come on the market in terms of uh, what we think the the sweet spot of the market is. Uh, maybe smaller apartments, uh, more bedrooms, uh, perhaps in order to maximize the square foot rent per, per apartment and uh, come close to, that we hope will enable us to come close to meeting the projections that we had when we started construction. So, so here's a big question. I know Lloyd sits on the loan committee at M&T Bank, uh, you know, since rents are going down in certain aspects, you know, effectively they may be 5 percent, 10 percent down, how are banks looking at it? How are, how, I mean, have you gone into the financing market to do some financing for any existing buildings or any potential new acquisitions today? Luckily, um, we have very little need to, to refinance. Most of our loans were five, seven-year loans with renewals. So we, we don't really have to go out to look for anything until 2011 to speak of. Um, but, you know, anecdotally, um, when we're looking at something new, um, 
the financing is available. The M and T, New York Community Bank, the M and T put us in business. They started with our first loan, and they're still around. And they haven't changed their standards, so to speak. You know, when all the when all of this um, uh, securitized uh, business was going along, they stuck they stuck to their standards. And and we did go other places from time to time because you could either get more proceeds or a lower rate. But basically, we never really got into the securitized business, and and and. They're around, and Sam's still there um, doing a reasonable loans so with so, reasonable coverage. I mean, you, you're on the loan committee, so you see every loan that comes in. What are you seeing? Ha, has has there been a little tightening on the underwriting? You know, because right now, you know, some of the other banks, Lloyd, I know they're no longer taking into consideration, you know, future rents. They're saying, here's what it is. If you have vacancy, I'm not giving you the potential. What, what are you seeing? Well, you sensitize <laughs> the downside a little better. But most everyone has cut their value proceeds. It used to be you'd borrow 75 to 80 percent, and now it's 65 to 70 percent, which is commensurate with that because at the end of the day, they're looking for <coughs> service coverage. Most of the banks previously looked at 110, 115 debt service coverage under the assumption that rents would grow and that you'd have 125, one or better coverage later on. Now they want you to start with 125, 130 coverage in case it does slide so that you will stay above 120. But here, here's another question. Now, Philip was just saying before, when they went into business, M&T was there, and you were an unproven commodity at that time. You were, you to were, some extent. Okay, you were a proven commodity in your professional thing, but you were an unproven over there. And in many cases in 2005, 2006, 2007, a lot of the new kids on the block came out to the market, and they were out there buying buildings from you or buying buildings from someone else. Today, even though the, there are the banks, there's the M&T, there's the Flushing Federal, the, the Astoria, and Signature. What about these guys? These guys, Capital One also, but they are also putting to the situation that they aren't looking for the unestablished guy today. Am yes. I correct? Yeah, you're correct. I mean, if, if, you, if you're not, you, you can't say, like in the development business, you can't say, I want to be a builder or a developer and I want to buy an apartment house now. You have to have a little bit more than that. Am I right or wrong? Well, there's always been the theory, you know your customer. I mean, that's... Every bank I've dealt with, there's a know your customer form or a form that generates from the Patriot. But now they don't want to know someone they haven't met before. Do you see? Do you see any? Do you see rents dropping any greater over the next? I mean, with this economy that we're in, Joel, anyone? You know, so I, I live as an optimist, but at the same time, I can say that right now we're in the uh, depth of the winter. And it's always slow times. January, February is not is not the best renting months. So I think that some of the softening we feel is because of winter, and some of the softening is because of the uh, financial circumstances, for sure. So what will happen over the next few months uh, will be interesting to see, and whether we get our normal seasonal improvements or whether we don't because of the financial crisis, uh, that really remains to be seen. Uh, you know, I think there's an interesting point. You have lots of units in Queens, the Bronx, and the other boroughs. I think today, you know, kids graduate from college, and when they graduate from college, they all wanted to move into Manhattan. Everybody was running, you know, you want to be in the Mecca, you want to be in Manhattan. What do you, I think that's going to be great for you because I think there's going to be a better situation that people are going to say, i got to make it more affordable. We see... Uh not only the kids who graduate from college, but we see people who've been, quote, downsized out of Lehman Brothers or somewhere else, and they no longer want to or can pay $4,200 for a one-bedroom apartment in parts of Manhattan. They can come to Queens and, and, uh, and get an apartment for $1,500 less than that or on, on Skillman see, Avenue. See, but I think that's an important point. I, I think I can see people going to, not because they don't want to be in Manhattan, because of the economic situation, that they're going to go to your situation. I mean, unfortunately, people can't get into your buildings up in the Bronx unless they qualify for an area median income. Well, that's correct. I mean, most of our product is government subsidized and there are income limits uh, to, uh, to move in. And so uh, the tenancy that we have is pretty stable because uh, we're providing housing at a market or for the Bronx or maybe below market rent. 
and it's a new, relatively new product or a new product, and so people uh, who move in they like they like the product and they want to they want to stay there. And so the tenancy is pretty stable there. Now um, you're building about 2,600 units or 3,000 units in the Bronx. Are any of them market rate? Well, we have uh, approximately uh, maybe five or six hundred units that will be market for the Bronx. In other words, instead of a two-bedroom that rents for seven hundred dollars, the rents are going to be about twelve or thirteen hundred dollars a month. Will they um, be also lottery? They will be, but uh, at that level, seeming as it's a market rent, we're going to have to, uh, you know, do the same thing that any landlord does to attract market rate tenants for whatever market they happen to be in. I mean, for my so, audience, explain what, what you mean with the lottery and the market rate tenants. Well, uh, any time that a project uh, receives government subsidies in order to ensure that the marketing of the uh, the project is fair, that we're not renting the apartments to our friends or whatever. We have what's a lottery process. The applications have to be mailed to people. They mail their application back to a locked box, and the locked box is opened under government supervision, and the uh, applications are recorded in uh, in number as to how they come out of the, literally how they come out of I, the locked I, box I understand in the post office. But what happens, you, I'm really I'm looking at the market rate. You're saying if you can't rent those units, to the market rate people, to, to the people in the lottery, you're able to go out to the general market. Correct. Once once we exhaust the uh, the list of uh, people who've applied through the through this lottery process, we would have to hire brokers and and beat down the bushes in order to uh, find tenants for those buildings. And, and at what rent? At the the market rent, which you know we've projected, let's say for a two bedroom apartment, about twelve hundred dollars a month in in uh, Melrose in the Bronx or uh, we have a loan actually with M&T uh, Bank on Shakespeare Avenue uh, where we're projecting that we're going to be renting two bedroom apartments for twelve or thirteen hundred dollars and month. those will be market rate that is market for that neighborhood so uh, you know it's obviously below market compared right, to Manhattan but, but it's right, uh, but, uh, the situation what are the apartments in Queens in the Bronx your apartments in Queens in the Bronx which are uh, for, uh, open to the public available for well, you can get a one bedroom in, depending on the neighborhood in Queens and Forest Hills, you could get one for sixteen hundred dollars, seventeen hundred dollars. On Skillman Avenue, it's probably fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars. In the Bronx. To, in the Bronx, uh, one bedroom, I, I would say, ten fifty to eleven hundred uh, is the the top end. And then it goes into the stabilization. Well, it's all stabilized. That, right. Those are all stabilized uh, rents and. Um, you know that that's that's where the market is, and and that's where our limits are too. So there's out there this kind of a little secret essentially that there's not that much difference between the stabilized rates and what the actual market is. So in the boroughs, it's not a big, it's not a suffering or the way it is. In, in what the, what uh, about New Jersey? Because you do have properties in New Jersey. What what's the situation there? Well, the I mean, close by in New Jersey. Yeah, we have them on the Palisades in West New York and Union City, which is really a very close community. And um, that's a very interesting community because basically it grew. It is the largest, for example, Cuban community in the country, except for South Miami. And a lot of people worked in the garment center for many years, and, and the community. It's the embroidery that's center. That's right. It's the embroidery center of the world, I think. Um, but what you had was same workforce housing that's that's built up there now with many more different Hispanic uh, countries involved and. You have rents which are very similar to um, Brooklyn now. When we got there, the average rent was four hundred and fifty dollars in our portfolio. Today, the average rent in that essentially the same portfolio that's been recapitalized with other books is about um, seven hundred and ninety dollars over a period of twelve years. Um, and the rent regulations there are are twice as favorable as they are in New York City. You what can do you mean? You can recapture the improvements in an apartment over 20 months. As opposed to the 40, 40 months, months right now. Right. And we, we, we look at about an average of a 32% per annum return on the um, rehabilitation cost of an apartment. So what do you see happening, Lloyd? You've been in this business long enough. What do you see happening with rentals in the condo world? Because I know Joel, which I'll ask the question, you were thinking of converting some of your buildings. What's happening with that? Well, one of the buildings that we're, we're still seriously looking at converting, and again, you know, our cost basis allows us to do that because we bought um, 
you know, at the right time. We've leveraged it appropriately. Uh, but, but I'll let Lloyd finish what he was going to say, and then I'll come back to that. Well, we, pull, we had two projects on the drawing board for Jersey City. One is a rental, one is a condo. We had, we had fin financing in place. We had financing in place. We had bought steel. Uh, we were in the final stages of finalizing all of the permits for the construction because it's just not one permit to start. We were ready to dr be driving piles, and I pulled the plug on it. Even though Jersey City rents were holding, we were looking at new rents uh, in place in the market six months ago as well as today being about 35 to 38 dollars a foot which for my audience is what uh, 1700 for one bedroom 1800 um maybe even a more. little more depend i mean we were designing rentals and most of the apartments in the marketplace originally more, more. were designed as condos so a 700 foot one bedroom is a large one bedroom rental whereas a 700 foot would be small in a condo so a one bedroom built for condo is typically 850 so, so why did why feet. so why did you stop on these two deals um, the market there is some uncertainty and i have the plans will will absorb a f the cost of the steel and all of it hopefully in 3 4 5 years or less i'll be able to start that project the condo market we stopped because that's where we saw uh, the market really stopped because those were financial district buyers. At Jersey City is, I liked very favorably in that we were looking at a housing stock that would be superior because it was mostly new buildings, high rise buildings, and the view of Manhattan is much better than the view of Jersey City. So if you're in Manhattan looking at Jersey City, it's not nearly as nice. And the commute time to the financial district from Jersey City or Hoboken is half the time it takes from the Upper East Side. Uh, but there's so much product in the Upper East Side that the market at in the $40 a foot could drop below the $38, which we were looking, we're performing in uh, Jersey City. And there is so much product on the Upper East Side. And even if the commute to the financial districts is twice as long, people would rather live in Manhattan. With regard to the people who rather live in Manhattan, I mean, you guys have been in business for at least 16 years, I think I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've never really gone anywhere but Manhattan. Uh, correct, and that's, that's our niche, and we love it for, for the reasons that the people have mentioned. Um, and we stay really in core, in core Manhattan. Um, one of the reasons is because the difference between fair market rent and stabilized rent, as you described, when you go to the boroughs, the differences are very narrow. In our case, the differences can be from $500 to $5,000, um, so, um, or more uh, in the case of a two bedroom. So, so the people do want to be in Manhattan. I think people would prefer to double up and be in Manhattan than go take an apartment in the boroughs. And you know, I, so I think like that's, that's, that's a fact. But when the economy is tough, but I, I have a question which really relates to both of you, because both of you, you, you have a number of buildings on Park Avenue, you have a couple of buildings on Madison Avenue, Fifth Avenue, some really great rental yeah. locations. Have you seen a reduction in rent in those apartments? You know, in, in or are they maintaining their value in today's market? The very large rents, because there aren't an extremely large portfolio of those, uh, are always up for negotiation. And the negotiation is at a lower rent than they were two years ago. There's a softening in the rental market. No, no, I I, that please. No, I, I was and it, appli it applies to the high end, so, so the low end, it's going the middle end. No, I, I, it, it, I, I would say it, it goes across okay, the whole I, spectrum. I, 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 I was going to be semi-positive. I know it's hard for anybody to believe that. But I was going to say that I felt, you know, with a certain number of, you know, if people want to be on Fifth Avenue or Madison Avenue, those rents might still be stable, you know, maybe be a 5% reduction as opposed to a 10 to 15% reduction. Well, and I think if you have a unique product, you're always going to price it accordingly. Yeah, because just playing the mathematics of percentages, when you cut a, a $15,000 rent or a $12,000 rent, $1,000, it's more significant uh, than cutting, 
you know, a two thousand dollar rent, you know, three hundred dollars or percentage wise, it's still seven percent. You know, so uh, right, but it costs the same amount to heat that building at those rents right, as it yeah. does at the smaller ones. So that's a a big piece of pure profit. You know, we were talking a little bit before about sellers. What what do you see? As people who are selling buildings are they cognizant that values have dropped? I haven't found you know, any. You, who are sellers in this market? There's who are then who are buyers are in this market? There, there really aren't that many mm. transactions going on. It's hard so, to point to trans to real transactions. I mean, didn't you buy in two thousand and eight? Um, yes, not residential. So you no. didn't. We, we bought in we bought in early two thousand eight. Right, you I bought a lot of units in two thousand eight. Yeah, How many and, units did you buy? Um, a couple of thousand. Yeah, we bought um, uh, several hundred million dollars of real estate, and uh, and we're very happy with those purchases. We bought them in, in early oh eight. They had a lot of value-added opportunities, of which we were able to execute on retail, and we renovate apartments. And so, and again, the um, the business market, as you said, the difference between buyers and sellers right now is a lot. There's not credit available to do acquisitions, and so there's largely no transactions for the moment. And uh, you know, I think credit has to come into the mix before that changes. Okay, last question before we have to go. When do you think the economy or the, when, and this is uh, your own crystal ball, when do you think things are going to get better in the economy and that you won't have to be reducing rents? Six months, a year, 12 months, 18 months? I think it's a year. Chuck? I would say hopefully it won't be more than a year. Uh, you know, before we hit bottom, I think could be a long time before rents really start to rise from that level, though, again. Lloyd? I'm generally an optimist, but I'm not as optimistic as the two prior opinions. So I how long do you think? I really think it's two years, but I think we're the tail of the dog. I think the economy there needs to be a fix in the banking industries and, cre and liquidity created so that there is some transactional business going on. Joel, mm -hmm. last. For me, I think that con consumer confidence and renter's confidence plays a big role. And uh, as people develop confidence, um, the rents will come back. And uh, so I think 09 is going to be a difficult year, but early early 10, I think we're going to be uh, in, in business in a very strong way. I'd like to thank uh, Joel Seiden, Lloyd Goldman, Chuck Brass, and Philip Eisenberg. See you next week. Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Cushman and Wakefield, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, New York Community Bank, Bank of America, Kilroy Metal Products, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Essex Capital Partners, Excel Realty Advisors, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, G.V.A. Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, John Katsimatidis, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Madison Realty Capital, Marcus and Millichap, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, the Moynihan Group.